So hello, everyone. Welcome to our mechanical engineering research seminar here at South Dakota Mines. So today we have Daniel uh, Bo, who is a master's student in mechanical engineering. He graduated from South Dakota Mines with a bachelor's in 2019, and he's going to share some of his research that he's doing under the supervision of, of Professor Kosro Shabazi. So Daniel, I'll hand it over to you and welcome. All right, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, like he said, I am in, in my second year in the master's program, and I've uh, been studying under Dr. Shabazi now at a uh, year and a half, and I you know too, I was part of the uh, accelerated master's program, which, which was pretty awesome to uh, have that opportunity to get ahead in my classes. Uh, and so, anyone, if anyone out there is thinking about doing that, um, I strongly suggest it, get on, get on that, because it's a, a great option. But anyways, uh, so today I'm gonna be talking about uh, two fluid flow and numerical solutions to two fluid flow. And in particular, uh, we're gonna be looking at high order uh, positivity preserving finite difference schemes. So by way of overview, I'm gonna start off by looking at uh, some applications. Uh, why are why is two flip two phase of uh, and fluid fluid flow necessary? Why do we, why are we interested in solving these problems? Uh, and then look at some just challenges and uh, overall objectives of this work, what we're trying to accomplish here. And so then we'll look at an overview of the model we're using, uh, and look a little bit at just at the mathematics of the physics there, uh, and then kind of dive into the methodology of the actual numerics we we'll, we are using, and then. We'll look at some numerical examples to demonstrate how the method works and finally go over a conclusion and look at where the research is at and where it is going. And so applications, why, why, are, why are we doing this? Why are we interested in two phase uh, or fluid dynamics? Well, these types of problems occur in a lot of different fields. Um, in fact, I mean, you could, say they occur, occur just about everywhere. Uh, some big uh, examples are in sustainable energy, uh, in the defense and aerospace industry. And uh, an interesting one um, I was reading about is in uh, volcanology. So in study of volcano eruptions, uh, finite difference of methods and numerical schemes can be used to model the propagation of the blast waves and other things going on with the uh, eruption of a volcano. And uh, another big application here is in healthcare and kind of focus a little bit here. Um, there's uh, applications, of course, in treatment modeling. Dr. Shabazi has done some, done some work in that area. And then uh, something I'm particularly interested in is in cold chain equipment. And so by cold chain, I'm referring to basically this big network of refrigeration systems that are needed to keep temperature sensitive vaccines and other uh, medical uh, devices safe uh, in a uh, protected environment and in, in a cold um, environment as they are transported from the manufacturing or distribution uh, facilities all the way out to the local uh, healthcare clinics. And in particular, we're interested in clinics in underdeveloped regions where uh, they may have power sometimes uh, or they may absolutely not have power. And if they do, it's probably quite unreliable. So this is a really challenging environment for refrigeration systems because you don't know when you're gonna have power, uh, you don't know how long you're gonna have power. And so you have to have systems that can adapt to that and be able to go for several days without, without power and be able to charge up when they have power. Uh, and then also there are outreach programs where maybe at a local facility, there will be a, a group of, of uh, immunizers who will go out into villages that are two, three, or even five days away from the nearest uh, power source, from the nearest generator. And so you need to have devices that can actively cool for upwards of five days in very, very harsh environments. And so this is a particularly challenging 
problem. And if you look up in this space at all, there's a lot of uh, interesting articles, a lot of TED Talks on some uh, various ideas people have come up with. Uh, and there's some interesting applications have been in adsorption or absorption based systems, uh, which is basically the same type of system that is used in an RV uh, refrigerator. Uh, in the olden days, I guess they would use an ammonia based system and it would be <clears throat> just absorbed uh, into a water uh, solute. And so that is one application. Uh, but the one I'd like to focus on is on vapor compression systems. So basically this is just scaling down uh, the common refrigerator we're all familiar with into a very uh, compact and efficient design. So basically we're talking about scaling that down to a small like 12 volt uh, DC compressor and basically a lunchbox size refrigerator. And the primary challenge with that is one, it has to be run on battery. And so, Ener efficiency is very important here. You don't want to be wasting any energy. And a problem that uh, could, could arise here is that of refrigerant migration, where after the run cycle, after the compressor shuts off, we have, we have warm, uh, mostly liquid, maybe a little bit of vapor uh, sitting in the condenser and a cold, the cold refrigerant in the evaporator. And then when a compressor shuts off, there's a pressure differential there. And then it can be shown that there's a transient state just for a few minutes after the compressor shuts off in which the warm refrigerant all migrates into the uh, vapor, vapor phase in the uh, evaporator. So in this case, we have warm liquid interacting with the cold vapor. And the problem with that is it can warm up the uh, that well, was in this storage chamber. And this is particularly an issue for cold chain equipment because we're working on very small scales. In most cases, refrigerant migration, um, it's a well-known thing, but it's not really worried about. People don't really consider it because applications are on large scale. But in small scale, when now, if we have uh, warm liquid coming in and interacting with the vapor and warming up, uh, locally warming up the vaccine storage compartment, that could cause problems is you could have local excursions above uh, safe temperatures. And also it's kind of it's, uh, uh, a loss and would be wasting energy. So that's just one, one example of a two fluid uh, or two phase uh, problem. And so some specific uh, challenges associated with these problems are, they are very uh, highly nonlinear. Um, we can have shock waves develop and there are a lot of complex uh, features going on. So a lot of wave propagation and high frequency uh, waves. And so the challenge with that is these things are happening in very, uh, very fine detail. And in order to even capture and uh, show these features, you have to have a high fidelity numerical algorithm that can uh, go to that level and will accurately uh, show those features. And then in addition to that, there can be very large discontinuous jumps, uh, especially in the two, two fluid model where you could say it could have uh, water and air uh, interacting. And then at the interface between water and air, you're gonna have a very large density jump. And so that can cause a problem too because numerical solutions have a hard time with uh, have a hard time with discontinuities, and especially ones of very large magnitude uh, can be particularly challenging and can uh, cause unphysical uh, unphysical solutions. And so, what we need to do is develop a scheme that can satisfy all these requirements. It needs to be hyperbolic. It needs to have real eigenvalues or real characteristic speeds. Uh, so the, the physics of two phase and, and, and fluid flow uh, based upon the, the characteristic speeds. So that would be the speed of so local speed of sound and the advection velocity of the fluid. And if our numerical scheme um, 
for whatever reason gives us complex speed of sound values, then that is a bad thing is that's unphysical and then the numerics will break down and the whole uh, scheme will, the whole simulation will crash. And then we need to have high order, uh, non-oscillatory and then a positivity preserving. So that's just all uh, basically being able to capture these find these uh, fine sharp features and being able to capture the discontinuities without oscillation. And then finally, we want to uh, be sure that we maintain simplicity and efficiency, uh, because if we're going to solve really hard problems in higher dimension, we need to be able to have scalability to running on running in parallel computers and uh, maintaining simplicity is going to significantly help in extending it, extending the model to uh, parallelization. And so this is where we start with the uh, uh, start with mathematics here. So basically this equation here is what we're trying to solve. This is just a conservation law, which is the mathematical uh, formulation of the physical law of conservation. So in here, we are looking at a function uh, u, which is some distribution of some physical quantity. Uh, this could be energy, it could be density uh, or the momentum. And so this just mathematically expresses the conservation of that quantity. And so if we put together and enforce the conservation of mass and momentum and energy, then we end up with a set of three coupled equations called the Euler system. And these govern the single, single fluid flow, uh, single fluid compressible flow. And so here, the first equation is conservation of density or specific, uh, specific mass. And then the second is for uh, the specific momentum. And then the fourth is for a specific total energy. And then here, just some nomenclature, we can define a vector of all of the conserved variables as the density, velocity, density, momentum, and total energy uh, defined as u. And then also we we'll need to be able to work with the primitive variable, variables, which are like the actual uh, measurable physical quantities that are the components of the conserved uh, quantities. And so that's just density, velocity, and pressure. And then finally, uh, the F represents our vector of fluxes. So these are just all the flux functions for each one of those uh, conserved properties. And so then to extend this to uh, admit a two fluid uh, model, we need to append two equations to the Euler system. And that those two equations are here. And basically these represent the advection of two interface properties. These interface capturing functions, uh, gamma one and gamma two, are both just functions of two uh, parameters. First is gamma, which is the specific heat ratio, and then pi, which is a empirical parameter of the stiffened gas equation of state. Because we are using a two fluid model that it will accept liquids, we can't just use the ideal gas law. Instead, we rely upon this stiffened gas equation of state, which just tacks on an extra, uh, an extra term, as you can see that pi parameter. And I would note that, that as you can see, that pi parameter uh, is zero for ideal gases and very big for uh, liquids. And so that, that's an example of where we'd see again, a, you could see a large discontinuity. And then in summary, we have this. This is our system that we need to solve. We have five equations plus a uh, equation of state at the end. So we need to solve this subject to oscillation shocks and whatever other crazy things are going to happen. And so the question is, in developing our finite, uh, in developing our numerical scheme, why do you use finite different schemes? Why do you use this approach? And the basic idea is that they, they can capture shock discontinuities, which is, is a must in this field. We need to be able to do that. And then also, they have 
good simplicity and efficiency. Uh, basic finite difference schemes are easy to derive and easy to implement. And so that's a, a, big, uh, a big plus for us as <laughs> looking forward to if we want to scale, have scalability here, uh, that simplicity is going to be key. And then also high order schemes. Uh, it can be shown that high order schemes can provide a big boost in the accuracy per CPU cost. So as we'll see here in a minute, with high order schemes, we can uh, obtain much greater efficiency um, with our overall algorithm. So that's demonstrated right here. This is running a simulation of just an advected sinusoid um, being basically just carried away by a constant velocity twice through our uh, domain. And here I used a first order and a fifth order uh, finite difference scheme. The orange, uh, the, the orange trace there is the first order, which as expected at only 50 grid points performs quite poorly. Uh, it is very dissipative and looks more flat than uh, anything else. And so uh, if we look at the fifth order solution, which using the same grid points, that compares very well with the black trace, which is uh, the exact solution. And so we know that the first order is going to perform poorly with only 50 grid points. So what we can do is do grid refinement and then just use more and more grid points in this domain uh, to get a more accurate solution. And so I ran, ramped up the uh, uh, grid points to 1600 for the first order solution and tried it again. And as you can see on the yellow trace, we're getting quite a bit better. And that's a lot more comparable to what we uh, wanna see. However, the table on top shows that even at 1600 grid points, we obtained an error percentage of 4.86, while the fifth order solution with only 50 grid points uh, gave us an error percentage of 0.1 and it ran for about 0.12 seconds less. So this just demonstrates that higher schemes can be very beneficial uh, in being much more efficient. And that's a very desirable qual quality uh, moving forward to more complicated uh, problems. However, there is a caveat and that is that right out of the box, the higher order finite difference schemes do not like discontinuities. And as we see here, this is just the same type of problem, just an advection, constant velocity advection problem, except instead of having a nice smooth sinusoid, here we just have a square pulse and that is being carried through the domain by a constant velocity twice. And as we see here, both the fifth and the third order solutions have oscillation. And the bad news is, is no matter what order we use, if we keep going higher order and no matter how much grid refinement we do, those oscillations will not go away. Uh, while the first order solution doesn't quite look like a square wave, but observe that it is, does, has no oscillations and uh, still retains the original bounds of the problem. So what we need to do is develop a nonlinear scheme that can adapt locally to discontinuities and switch from being a high order solution to a first order solution to avoid those sharp discontinuities at the, uh, at, at those interface and at those interface, yes. And so the goal here is we need to solve this problem on top. This is just a discrete form of the advection equation. Uh, so just, just some basic uh, nomenclature here. So we're all on the same page. Uh, in this dis discretized domain, we just take the whole domain and break it up into N points. And then just denote an arbitrary point uh, in the domain as XI. And so for the function U, we can denote some uh, point as UI and then the superscript N just denotes a specific time step that we are at. And so, with that in mind, our approach here is going to be to look at uh, basically each individual point as a cell. So at each point xi, 
if we think of this as like a control volume where the boundaries of this volume are defined at xi plus one half and xi minus one half. Then using the divergence theorem, we can relate the derivative of the flux to the flux values evaluated at those boundary points. However, we don't know what the flux is at those boundary points. We don't know what the function u is at those boundary points. We only know it at each grid point, at each xi. So in general, our goal in our scheme is to find non-oscillatory high order approximations to the cell boundary fluxes. So we just need to develop approximations for the function evaluated at those midpoints in between each uh, grid point. And so this is the plan. Uh, this is going to, we're going to use the weighted essentially non-oscillatory or the WINO method. And so uh, the steps here are, we're gonna first uh, decide what order we'd like to use. So let's say in this case, we, we want to, um, let's say we wanna make a third order uh, approximation for the cell boundary point at Xi. And so we have a few options here. Uh, for third order approximation, we need to use three points. And there are three collection of points or stencils that all, have, all contain the point Xi and all, each one of those could be a candidate to develop uh, this approximation. So what the Wino method does is it says, let's form an approximation from each one of those candidate stencils. So in this case, we would form an approximation using the points of stencil A, and then form another one using the points on stencil B, and then another one on C. And then what we would do is for each one of those approximations, we would measure the smoothness of that approximation. And then we would combine all three approximations into one overall approximation where the weights of each approximation are proportional to the smoothness. So in this case, stencil A, as you can see, contains a discontinuity. So we would want no contribution from that approximation. And the same thing would be true about stencil B as a discontinuity. So if we include it in our overall approximation, we're gonna have oscillation. So in this case, the only one that doesn't contain discontinuity is stencil C. So ideally what our, our, what our method would do would be to recognize this and then give stencil A and B a weight of zero or giving stencil C um, some optimal weight. And the idea would be that if all of the stencils are smooth and everything is looking good, then because we have a total of five points in our overall approximation, we would want to assemble everything such that we would obtain a fifth order approximation. So the Wino method gives us a lower order approximation at a discontinuity, but then in smooth region, it gives us an optimal higher order approximation. And so here's what that looks like. Equation, on equation eight, those P terms on the right-hand side, those are the polynomial approximation at each stencil. And then on the left, we see the P we know. That is the overall uh, approximation at that point. And then the omegas, those are the weights. Uh, and in fact, those are just a normalization of the actual nonlinear weight, the alphas. And the alphas are just inversely proportional to the smoothness indicators, which are defined in equation 10. So this, this ugly looking equation here, this is just represents the uh, sum of all of the derivatives uh, over that uh, polynomial approximation. So if that interval contains a discontinuity, then those derivative terms, the sum of all those is gonna be really, really big. And so then our nonlinear weight in equation nine is gonna be really small because it has that term in the denominator. And so that get, would give us what we want, a scheme that uh, gives us some opt optimal weight, the B R K for a smooth stencil and then go to zero for a discontinuous stencil. So as to summarize, we're just gonna form a polynomial approximation 
at each candidate stencil and then put them all together and weight them appropriately based upon a smoothness indicator. So after that process, we would obtain the function reconstruction approximated at each intercell point at each cell boundary. And then we can put all those together and then form high order derivative approximation using this function or this equation on the bottom. And the D terms there, those are constants for which we have tabulated up to 13th order. And so now putting all of this together and running uh, that same problem that we had issues with previously, uh, just the advected square pulse. Uh, the blue trace is the fifth order Wino scheme, and then the green is just the regular uh, fifth order finding different scheme. And we see that uh, we succeeded in, in greatly attenuating those oscillations. So that's, that's a good sign. That's good to see. And now for a more interesting problem, this is uh, a solution for an Euler equations problem. So this is a shock wave interacting with an entropy uh, disturbance in the domain. And this is just a, a model for, uh, for error. And as you can see, the solution on top, which is just the uh, linear finite difference scheme, gives us some bad oscillations at those sharp cusps and uh, sharp points in the, in, in, the, in the solution. While the Wino scheme uh, gives us nice, uh, nice crisp points everywhere and looks a lot better. So again, that is that's what we wanted to see is the non-oscillatory solution. However, once again, there is a bit of a caveat. And that is the Wino scheme is essentially not oscillatory, meaning that small oscillations may remain. Now, in a lot of problems, just like in the previous one, uh, this wasn't an issue. But in some cases, this definitely causes issues. In particular, if we have large discontinuities and large jumps where we aren't even talking magnitudes of like a density ratios or pressure ratios of a thousand or 10,000 or more. So these would be in high mock shocks or in blast wave problems. We could see these slight oscillations would give us a negative density or a negative pressure value, which that would then imply a complex speed of sound, which would subsequently crash the whole simulation. So in order to achieve a robust scheme, we need to have some way of methodolic, methodologically, can't talk, I guess, but uh, we need to have a method for enforcing the positivity of density and pressure. And so here's an example of that. This is a problem where we have a very large pressure ratio of a thousand. And then I ran this simulation uh, using the Wino scheme for just one time step. And as you can see, after that one time step, we developed a negative pressure value. And looking at the magnitudes we're concerned with here, uh, it's, it's not negative by much, it's very small, but it's still gonna crash the entire program. So if I were to try and run this on, run another time step on this simulation, it would throw me in error and then I wouldn't be able to uh, continue, with it, continue with it. So our plan here is to take advantage of the fact that the first order solution is always going to give us uh, physical values. So for the case of the Euler equations, we want positive pressure and positive density. And the first order solution can be shown to give that to us guaranteed. It's not oscillatory and bounded and will give us, uh, give us the positivity we desire. And so what the plan is, is to combine the high order and first order fluxes whenever we need to, to prevent us from going negative, such that though that we still retain uh, the high order solution. And so to do that, we need to put our, put, put our solution uh, into the form shown below. Uh, here, the capital H is our high order Wiener reconstruction uh, flux. 
and then the low HI, that is just the flux uh, from purely from the first order method. And so this is accomplished by building the Wiener reconstruction. And then in our case, we would have to do several uh, Runger cut of time steps. Uh, we, if we're using Runger cut of time integration, then we would obtain the flux, the high order flux from each one of those integrations and then assemble them all together. And then we would perform this uh, procedure after the last uh, wrong or cut at stage. And then for the first order solution, uh, we can just obtain that flux using forward, uh, the forward Euler. And so the scheme then takes the following form. Where on top, we form a uh, combined flux, a modified flux, these H tilde values as a combination of the first order, the H plus the higher, order, the capital H. And then these theta values, these are the locally defined limiting parameters. And so if we have, if you see, if we have a theta of one, then we're going to uh, retain the higher order, solute, higher order flux because the two uh, lowercase h terms will cancel. Uh, but if the theta goes to zero, then we're gonna obtain a uh, pure first order flux. And so the question is, is how do, we, how do we find those thetas? How do we identify those? And so for the case of a linear function, uh, like density would be, it can be found by substituting in this modified flux into uh, an inequality that enforces the, dense, the positivity on density. And then in doing that, and then considering the four different cases, considering four different uh, cases and combinations for uh, how these fluxes combine, <clears throat> we can end up with a pretty straightforward uh, set of four logical statements that fully define what these thetas need to be. So it's a pretty simple process that doesn't really add a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot, a whole lot of complexity to uh, the overall scheme. Things get a little bit more challenging uh, for a nonlinear function, like pressure, where pressure is dependent upon both the density and the velocity. And so we can't just use these uh, 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 set of four logical statements. Instead, we actually have to use a uh, numerical root finding technique at, uh, at any point where we need to identify what those, what those flux limiting parameters are. So in general, what we would do is form those modified fluxes, the H tilde's, and then substitute those back into our original, uh, our original scheme, and then just continue on from there. And so an example of this, let's consider a problem uh, which involves a Mach 9.86 shock uh, traveling through helium that crashes into a density interface. And the density interface has a ratio of a thousand across it. So we would expect this problem without uh, positivity to give us uh, bad results to crash because we would probably obtain a negative density value. And that is exactly what we see. On this graph, we see after one time step, the orange trace that is just for the previously developed uh, we know scheme without any positivity implementing positivity enforcing procedure. And after one time step that goes negative. And once again, the whole system crashes, the whole, pro the whole program crashes and you can't run any more uh, time steps. While the blue trace is our positivity preserving scheme. And as you can see, it gives us a solution in between the first order and the higher order solution and retains the positive value for density, which is exactly what we want to see. And so that's a good sign because that means we can actually run this problem and get a result. Uh, using the, the traditional, the uh, previous Wino scheme, we couldn't do that. It would run run time step and then it would crash. And so here we can solve this problem, which uh, is, a really good illustration for the benefits and the power of these higher order schemes. On the left panel, we have a fifth order solution 
and a first order solution, both uh, for 200 grid points. So not a whole lot of grid refinement, but we can see the fifth order solution uh, captures this large jump in density that we see right at the interface, while the first order solution doesn't, doesn't even detect it. And so doing some grid refinement, we can see that things can improve a bit. Uh, the fifth order solution at a thousand grid points gives us a sharp, crisp profile at that interface. The first order solution, we have to go all the way up to about 10,000 points to get even close to what uh, the fifth order solution gave us at 200 points. And so this is at 10,000 points. And even then, we're still not really even close to where the fifth order solution was at 1,000 points. And so I ramped this up quite a bit uh, to see how, many, how much grid refinement I would have to do uh, in order to get a comparable solution to the fifth order to the higher scheme. And at 50,000 grid points, and that's, this is on the yellow trace, you can see we finally get close to the accuracy of high order solution. And that is using 50 times more grid points. And as you can see, the CPU cost there, it ran for 1300 seconds, while the high order scheme ran for 28 seconds. So this demonstrates that we were able to obtain for this challenging problem, uh, significantly better performance using a high order method. And so this is kind of the current status of this, of this research, and that is extending this positivity scheme towards a, towards a general two fluid system. And in order to do that, uh, so for the Euler system, we needed to enforce positive density and positive pressure. In the case of two fluids, it's a little bit different. Um, if you remember, we had those two order parameters or those gamma one and gamma two, which are the interface capturing functions. So we need to enforce the, bound, the bounds on those, and then we need to enforce the positivity of density again. But if for the case of two fluid, for the two fluid system, we could still actually physically obtain negative pressure values. And so rather than just enforcing uh, positivity of pressure, we enforce the positivity of a modified pressure defined here as the pressure plus pi divided by uh, gamma minus one. And this will ensure that we obtain, enforcing pos positivity upon this will ensure that we obtain a real speed of sound. And so the actual implementation of this is very similar to what we did in the Euler system case. We're just gonna form modified fluxes from the first and the higher order values, uh, except we're gonna to have to do it three times, uh, once for each order parameter and then for the density. So three times for a linear case, and then we're gonna to have to do it, run through this scheme again for the pressure. And there is one uh, fairly big difference here, and that is that because of the source terms in the order parameter equations, we have to add this restriction that the flux limiter, those theta values at each cell boundary for a given cell uh, need to be equivalent. If we fail to do this, we end up with some unphysical results. And that is shown right here. On the left-hand uh, panel, this is running the scheme for a problem of just an advected uh, interface. So this is just an interface of two different, uh, two different fluids. And then that's just being advected away uh, through the domain by a constant velocity. So the left-hand solution is running this simulation using the positivity scheme uh, and enforcing that condition of equal flux limiters. On the right-hand side is running the same type of positivity scheme we used for the Euler system, which does not enforce that those flux limiters at the cell be equal. And as you see here, we obtain an unphysical result that doesn't make any sense. And this is because we need to have the conservation, we need to enforce that we need to have the, those order parameters and their uh, source terms, we need to have a constant, theta values at each cell. 
So then finally, the current status of this project and this research. So we talked about uh, the Wino the finite difference scheme and we developed that. And then we added to that a positivity preserving scheme for the Euler system. And so we're continuing to work and this is ongoing is extending that to the general two fluid uh, problem set. And so the whole goal here is, as we, as, as we had seen from those examples, was being able to run, uh, have, have robust code that can handle challenging problems with large discontinuities and retain, enforce the positivity so we can actually run those problems. Um, that is, as, as we've seen with the, with the non-positivity preserving scheme, uh, we obtain negative values and the whole system would crash. And so that is where this research is headed. And uh, that's all I've got for today. So thank you for your time. Great, let's yeah. give Daniel a round of applause. So certainly we have a little bit of time for questions. If you have a question, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask away or put it in the chat. Daniel, did you guys look at, at other ways to resolve this, this positivity preservation besides what you talked about today? I mean, you know, did you look yeah. at some other mathematical approaches to try and get, get, you that, get you where you needed to go? Yes, there, there, are, uh, there have been other approaches. Um, most of the approaches done have uh, been for finite volume schemes and have been applied there. And so using our, for our model, this flux limiting approach uh, is, is, is the current way of approaching those other ones that have previously been developed and are uh, more prevalent in lit literature but not be applicable to our two fluid uh, finite difference scheme. Would this work with more than two fluids? With more than two fluids? Uh, at the moment, because we just have to, we, at the moment, those order parameters are defining, it would only be applicable for uh, two fluids. You have to add. Yeah, I know, but could, could you expand? I mean, could you take the strategy and make it work, you think? I suppose we, I suppose, I suppose we probably could. Um, that would be something I'd have to, have to look into more and study more, but off the top of my head, I would say I don't, I, I immediately don't see any, uh, don't see any reason why it wouldn't be uh, something that we can pursue. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So if you have a question, go ahead and ask away. Daniel, a uh, question for you about what you're going to do next. Is this something that you're going to continue on into a PhD or if you're thinking about how you might take what you've done and go into industry or, or something else? Yeah, uh, so the current, uh, our current path is to work towards publishing, taking this work and publishing a paper. And so then my plans would be after completing that, I would um, continue on with my job. I, I'm actually currently working full time uh, for a lab out in Washington. And so I plan on just continuing on in there. And I hope to um, be able to uh, utilize, utilize this work I'm doing here and uh, other parts of it into that, into that, uh, into that position. All right, thanks. So we might lean on some awkward silence to see if there's any more questions.
All right, we're about out of time. So this might be a good stopping point. Daniel, thank you for, for presenting your research. Let's give him another round of applause.